take a second to welcome everybody. Uh, isn't this a cool venue? This is Richard's place here. Uh, he's in control of the thermostat, so if you're hot or cold, just let him know. You feeling okay? You good? Mm -hmm. that? Great. Um, okay, so this is part of a, a program that Sierra Commons is involved with that is uh, trying to kind of reignite the tech community in Nevada County. Uh, Sierra Commons is a co-working space and a business community, um, and so that it takes community to do that. And um, we're put on these monthly tech meetups. Uh, this is the third in uh, our series of monthly ones, so it's cool. It's all about AI, obviously. Um, and I'm so proud of myself. I got the next months already lined up. Uh, there's flyers in the back, and uh, Nick Federoff is presenting and. Some of you might know Nick as a magician in town. Some of you might know Nick from the burlesque uh, troupe in town. Some of you might know Nick as a, kind of a high-end bartender at some of the finer establishments in town. But no one knew, even I didn't know, that he goes around internationally and speaks on cybersecurity. Uh, so he's a renaissance. Guy, clearly secure. And the the presentation is not just like gone, you know. Uh, use passwords, use secure passwords. It's really about like the whole gamut of security, from um, not getting rolled in the alley, and how you present yourself, to you know, uh, geopolitical crisis and double authentication and authentication keys and things like that. So it's really taking a whole look at your whole security and how, you, how you deal with that so that should be really interesting and he's needless to say a pretty good um entertainer um another thing we have going on is here commons is our kind of our flagship offering it's just a, the business igniter course it happens two times a year it's starting march um seven there's some spots left and uh let's see eric you are a graduate any other graduates here no okay well uh, talk to Eric. He'll tell you how rad it is. Uh, helps people start grow their business. Um, so this event is actually um, a secret plan to get people that are tech-minded together and socialize and say, "Oh, like uh, I'm into. What are you into? What is, what's your thing? Culture building. Um, maybe you can just tell yeah. people a little bit for a second about that." Sure. <laughs> so my wife and I have had a, somewhat of a history of training people, and we're really interested in helping small business, small teams build a culture which is more productive and more satisfying to people who are in it. Uh, we're very aware of how culture is changing as a result of all the technology that we're going to see tonight. Yeah. So we're addressing that. That's what we're up to. Awesome. So people like this? Awesome. What, what, what do you do? I'm just curious. Just I'm into invention. In, into invention? Yeah, yeah. I have a few of mine and I'm just trying to tell them. What's one you can talk about? Uh, Perch Camp. It's a drone that should be able to land on an edge or a wire. Uh -huh. And it's a, you know, it has a digital control system with an AI that recognizes certain things <coughs> like wires. Great. Okay. Yeah. And so, so when you could perch it somewhere, yeah, and you can take pictures from that perch, and it's not using up good air time, covering. It's the idea to extend the life of whatever battery you have. Okay. So uh, already there's a couple interesting folk here. I know David, you've been into AI for a long time. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll have a chance to mingle, and you can kind of make some connections. But in the meantime, this is this is what's happening, I think, what's happening tonight, is Ethan, who uh, works at Sierra Commons, so he's intern at Sierra Commons, as well as Sister Faith, uh, both work there, um, is gonna just give a brief overview of some of the cool uh, AI, kind of think of it as like almost consumer level stuff now. Um, and then maybe for about 15 minutes or so, you can ask some questions or share some knowledge then Leo, back there, um, has a uh, uh, really interesting company 
in town, and he's gonna talk about that, and then we may move into some of the social implications of AI and what it could mean to education or uh, uh, equity, inclusion, uh, legal things. I'm writing a grant right now, and I was like, um, tell me what the, you know, how to compare two business models and find out which one's best. 30 seconds, I was just like, boom. <laughs> I could, um, it wasn't perfect, but I modified it. It pr literally saved me two hours. It was done in 30 seconds. So it's like out there now, it's, it's yes, useful. It's a, it's a game changer. So with that, Ethan has prepared a presentation. And I have. Hello fellow technology and AI enthusiasts. My name is Ethan Vickers. As he said, I'm an intern at Sierra Commons and uh, I'm kicking off this fantastic event by talking about and demonstrating some AI tools that are widely available. Um, and an AI, aka artificial intelligence, is basically what I would consider to be our next stage in evolution. Uh, it's gonna bring us into a world so advanced that a light bulb is gonna look like the first flame sparked by man. Um, and while we're not quite there yet, we do have a glimpse into what that future may look like um, through these available tools. Um, now, AI tools at this point are pretty much capable of anything as long as you have the right uh, imagination. Uh, and I mean, it can provide a recap based on uh, sales, logistics, it can uh, provide marketing images, create job descriptions and posting for, postings for that job and uh, it can create event advertisements. The list goes on, its capabilities are endless. Uh, Chat GPT, for example, uh, it can, uh, it, it, it's the pinnacle of AI as far as I've seen it. it. It can pretty much answer anything as long as it's in a text format. It can, uh, sorry, it can solve pretty much any problem. Um, I, I've used it personally to write me LinkedIn posts summarizing articles. I've made it summarize three articles. I just had to provide the link for it. Um, and uh, I've had to write me code for a game where the objective is to toss darts at balloons. It's a, uh, it, I even had to write me a speech. Uh, or I had to write the uh, bits for the speech that so I'm uh, reading you now. The, uh, the thing about ChatGPT is its responses can change based on uh, very few wording. It can go from like, write me a summary of a book to write me an enticing summary of a book. Write me uh, uh, a user-friendly summary of a book. It can, it, and it will give you a completely different response than uh, the previous wording would have given you. So wording is very important with this bot. It can also sort of make conclusions in what you're saying. So if you say something that isn't very specific, it can sort of make a guess like, oh, this is actually what they meant. So that's very neat. Uh, however, a downside to it is uh, some of its limitations are it can't, it can't uh, write any profanity or lewd content. It's very, uh, or any political sided answers, it can't give opinions, and it can't process anything that, like, say, wouldn't be safe for work. It's very strict in that regard. Uh, however, the, uh, uh, the, this, this can be used in business to quickly generate descriptions for jobs. It can compile and analyze statistics. It can make campaign ideas, event suggestions, write you code for websites, give you website performance suggestions, it can do a ton for business. And, uh, and it's just so many possible advantages. And the best part is it's both efficient at its job as it is good at its job. So like it can give good answers and it's very fast. Um, so, so very wonderful. Uh, for personal use, it can provide baking recipes, write resumes and covers letters, give creative suggestions, uh, uh, and, and it, uh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I we can't see it work. We can't see it work. 
Uh, and then I, I just have a couple other examples that mm -hmm. I just wanted to read. It can also convert measurements, it can write love letters for struggling relationships, and write some rather corny jokes. Mm -hmm. I cannot stress the amount of use you can get out of it. So, demonstration, does anybody have something they would like to ask the almighty AI? Faith, give me a suggestion. <laughs> um, have it write you, uh, I don't know, a summary of this event. All right, write me a summary of a of an AI. Does it do current events? Uh, it can't search the internet, so it can't do current events. This broke. Uh, so it, it can't do current events, although it can do uh, recent events, depending on when it was last updated. Sorry, give this just a second. Faith. I didn't like your answer. Robert, do you have a suggestion for me no. instead? How about, how about how long does Putin have to live? <laughs> I don't know if we can give it yeah, up, but you... Know. Should I try it? Try it, sure. Yeah, all right. How long does Putin have to live? It does not have access to that information <laughs> about any individual <laughs> class. So I've, that, I've got so. one that I've used before. Go ahead. Write me a story about Bigfoot in the um, style of William Shakespeare. <laughs> All right. Write me a story about Bigfoot in the style of Shakespeare. I didn't spell that right. I'll get the message. You can do it. Sometimes the server gets overloaded. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'll so this is so getting on. You you need to register, and then when you get on. What <laughs> creature yonder? <laughs> oh hark! What be that creature yonder that treads amongst the forest ground? A figure towering, stout and ponder, and yet with naught but peace profound. <laughs> Behold, its hair. <laughs> A tangle wild, a pelt. I'm not gonna read this anymore. You get the idea. Wow. It can do. Okay, let's rewrite it. Yes. <laughs> rewrite it in the style of a mafia don. All right. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna click stop generating. Okay. Rewrite the tale, but in a style of the mafia. The mafia. <clears throat> Check it out. What do you see over there? This is no ordinary dude, I swear. A giant covered in head to toe, the likes of which we ain't seen before. It moves with a slow, deliberate gait, like it's got all the time in the world, mate. But don't be fooled, it's as strong as an ox, and it's got a temper that'll knock off your socks. Some say it's a myth, a tale they spin, a tall tale they spin, but I've seen it with my own eyes, I, and I'm all in. So don't mess with Bigfoot, Bigfoot, he's the real deal, or you'll be begging for mercy with your last meal. There you go. <laughs> How about, um, what's the one about Sorry? Like tourism marketing. Oh, okay. Peace uh, for Nevada City. Write me a tourism marketing piece. How many people here have used ChatGPT before? Nevada. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Write me a story. Welcome to Nevada City, a charming and historic town nestled in the heart of the Sierra Nevada foothills. Whether you're a histor history buff, an outdoor enthusiast, or simply looking for a relaxing gateway, Nevada City has something for everyone. Step back in time and explore a picturesque ta downtown where Victorian era buildings uh, house unique sh no wait, Victoria era buildings <coughs> house unique shops, art galleries, and gourmet restaurants. Take a stroll along the tree-lined streets and so I should have asked for a humorous marketing uh -huh. piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Hmm. Spike it with humor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Make it humorous. <laughs> can I well, you don't have to retype everything. You can just uh, follow it. the link. 
Welcome to Nevada City, the town that has something for everyone, unless you're looking for a beach, in which case we suggest you keep looking. But seriously, folks, if you're tired of the same old tourist traps and crowded destinations, come experience the charm and quirkiness of Nevada City. We've got more history than your grandpa's attic, with Victorian era buildings and colorful characters around every corner. And if you're lucky, you might even catch a glimpse of Bigfoot. <laughs> Just go tell the locals we sent you. So there you see you can also go back in conversation and reference information yeah. previously. Interesting. But it's not all dusty relics and folklore. I'm gonna stop reading there. You get the idea. How about we do one more and then move on? One more. Who uh, anybody has one more question? Alright, let's go. Uh, so how, actually how long are is there a length limit? Uh, there is a length limit, although I have yet to find out. Uh, I've just asked for one question, and it would have written me pages long worth of code, and it could not write pages long worth of code. So, there is a limit, I just have yet to find it, uh, apart from that one instance. In fact, actually, I could probably ask, what is your character limit? Just say This shouldn't be a hard question. What language does it write code in? 2,048 characters. Uh, at a time. It can, uh, oh yeah, at a time. Uh, it can code in pretty much any uh, language you give it. Like you can say, write me this for Python, write me this for C, Sharp Plus. It can write pretty much any kind of Could it write a screenplay for a movie? It could write a screenplay. I asked it to you once and it's kind of sputtered out at the character limit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So now I'm just going to end that really quick and move it to our next one. There we go. Okay, that's going to be not, yes, that is the right one. That's going to be Dolly 2. Dolly 2, or this, I'm just going to call it Dolly. Uh, Dolly is another great example of a useful AI in both terms of personal entertainment and business purposes. Dolly is an image generator that, you can, that can, when fed a prompt, uh, produce the most spectacular art. This is great for when you're trying to publish an ad. Uh, for, uh, sorry, when uh, an image for a post, or you, and you just can't find the right image, uh, it doesn't match up to what you're envisioning in your head. Um, it's one that so, so you can just head over to Dolly, plug in the prompt of what you're imagining, and it can and it can pump out pretty much what you give it. It will generate an image based on your description and how it works is just the more specific, the better the image you're going to get. Uh, and if it doesn't match up to uh, your description that you've given it, like it doesn't feel right to you, you can always hit regenerate and it will generate uh, a different set of images with the same, uh, with the same prompt and you can just keep clicking regenerate till you find the perfect art piece. Uh, so, as far as, although a disadvantage for this AI is it can't make jumps in logic, so like, if you're not specific enough, it can't just assume you mean this or that, you have to be really specific with it. Uh, now, save the business purposes, advertisements, postings, all that. For personal entertainment, this one should be fairly obvious. To all my nerds that are in this group, all my fellow nerds, have you ever wanted to see Darth Vader and Doctor Strange fight? <laughs> Good news, this one can do it for you. You just gotta be, once again, really specific, but you can do it. And that's one of the fun things about it. And quite frankly, the, the best way to describe Dolly is through a demonstration. So we're gonna do a demonstration again. Anybody have any prompts they'd like to see? Sure. Well, the one you just spoke. Darth Vader versus Doctor Strange. Let's go. <laughs> Darth Vader fighting Doctor Strange. While we're waiting, is Chat GPT only in English? Uh, no, I can't. I believe it can do uh, multiple languages. Okay. Uh, I, 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 That's okay. I think we'll you can just type. Yeah. Say it in Spanish, and then it will say it in Spanish. So let's see if it's finished generating. Well, you can run it through translator. That's also true. You can run it through translator if it's mm -hmm. that difficult to read. Um, <coughs> although I believe it goes off your web preference, like on a web browser. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, Doctor Darth Vader fighting Doctor Strange. 
Would be what? Videos? They're just pictures? Yeah. Images. There's AI video editing soft um, websites as well. Yeah, I should probably do that. You know what? I'm going to just add a little, uh, little, little extra thing. Uh, there to see if it will generate better image. As you can see though, it definitely got Darth Vader in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I just had to be more specific with Doctor Strange, I think. But otherwise, there you go, that one's pretty good. <laughs> uh, and, and that one's also alright. The point is, you get the idea, the more specific, the better. Uh, it can generate some pretty cool looking art. Anybody else have any uh, prompts they would like to see? Yep. Could you upload a photo and ask it to do like some Photoshop commands, like replace the background or? Yes, you can. Actually, I didn't uh, talk about that because uh, I didn't realize this photo was there until you just said that. Uh, there's an upload button right there where you can upload a piece of art. So like, I'm not going to do it right now. I don't have the internet for that, but you get the idea. You can upload an image and it can edit it to how you desire. Anybody else have any prompts? Both of these are public domain? They're they free. are both completely free to you, uh, available to everybody. Um, however, if you want, um, like chat GPT, you can get uh, a basically pro version of it so that you have priority access when the servers go down. Um, you have access to uh, future versions, like the most current uh, updated version. Best way I can describe it. Uh, otherwise, yes, it's completely free to everybody. And the images, for example, the images that are created here are license free too, because nice. they were just created out of right. nothing. Well, yeah, Dolly. Um, were you. they created out of nothing, or were they harvested from deviant art in places like that? I don't think it's it, harvested from deviant art. It yeah. does yeah. Uh, <laughs> use references from uh, internet produced um, artwork but it uh, manipulates it in a way that it is considered fair use, um, so. What if, what if you uploaded an image of Mickey Mouse? Disney would feel mm -hmm. strongly about that. You could upload an image of Mickey Mouse and then you can't use that <coughs> image you uploaded uh, license free, but once you have it warp it to whatever you're, is going on in your head, then it can, then it can definitely be uh, license free because they can't really complain about that. You just can't call it Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the name that's copyrighted. So like I could upload Mickey Mouse and then say turn it into a demon and then I have demon Mickey Mouse. They can't license that. I don't think Disney would want to license that. <laughs> uh, so there's that. And then uh, should I move on? Alright. And then finally the next thing we're gonna look at switch tabs here. I have to stop casting and recast every time I switch tab. All right. So uh, as you can see, Dolly, basically, it, 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 the only limitation to its generation is your imagination. I just used uh, in about three times in one sentence and it worked. There are so many amazing AI tools out there, as you have seen, and the two I've discussed isn't even scratching the surface. Uh, and they're, they're, they're just as simply most notable and most useful ones you can find out there. Then uh, there are other tools like InferKit, which I'm going to show a demonstration of here, uh, of here in a second. Um, and it's it, it can generate stories based off a couple text words. So like you start a story and then it will just continue off of that. Like once upon a time, there was a man named Skid Row. That's going to create quite a wild story. Um, and you can, uh, you can edit the attributes such as randomness, creativity, the amount of words typed, all that fun stuff. It can make for some really funny stories. And once again, can also be helpful in business when trying to write maybe a writer, writer's bio and you want some, a, a creative writer's bio that ChatGPT just isn't giving you. Personal uses, writes you a bedtime story. <laughs> Uh, there, there's Crisp, which uses AI to cancel out any background noise in phone calls, Zoom meetings, uh, it, also when you're recording a video, a live streaming, it cancels out background noise. Uh, Crisp. It's spelled with a K. Um, and then there's also a program called Wombo AI. This one isn't really business useful, it's just for per personal entertainment. It takes a still picture of you or your friend or 
some random art you found online and it will make it sing and dance for you. It's terrifying, but it's also hilarious. That is exactly what I used to make Xander sing. Um, Say that name again. Uh, Wombo, A-I, W-O-M-B-O uh, dot A-I. Uh, and then the, the, this is just a portion of it all. Of course, there are a bunch of AI tools out there that are available to the public. Some you do have to pay for, so I decided to list the free ones, such as this one that I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. And, and it, it's just all so fascinating to look into, and it pushes us into a grand age of humanity, a stepping stone in technology. And so now I'm going to demonstrate Inferred Kit, and that will conclude this demonstration. Does anybody have any prompts they would like to start a story with? Faith? Where'd Robert go? <laughs> Is, okay, he's gone. What about one foggy night in the city? Alright, one foggy night in Nevada City. And this is going to be using the default attributes. So the randomness and creativity is uh, the default. One foggy night in Nevada City, the once lovable and an inspiration to everyone in our country has been revealed as an unmitigated threat. <laughs> Patrick, thank you for uh, an honorable man, but his time in Congress needs to be over. I may have fiddled with the attributes a bit without knowing it. My apologies. Let's see here. Advanced settings. Yep, I was right. Now uh, let's see what the average ones are. Okay, we're gonna turn that down to 24. All right, generate text. Tara Corwin, Nevada City, private school choice is the answer. I was surprised to see the op-ed by assemblyman Brian Dahl R. Beaver regarding private school choice. You know what? Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I should have thought about the, the 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 attributes before pulling this up. But it's still cool. <laughs> um, in fact, let me see exactly what I did wrong here. Control the randomness. Yeah, that explains it. Overall. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, with that said, thank you all for coming to this tech meetup. I hope you have had fun witnessing some neat AI demonstrations. And uh, with that, we shall continue the rest of our night. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. This guy just uh, graduated recently and uh, started this business here. So you want to? Sure. And donating the space to us tonight. So. Well, since um, since 1975 or so, when I arrived in town, I always wanted an office on Broad Street. I just thought that would be the coolest thing. Uh, but I wasn't an insurance agent. I wasn't a real estate agent. I had no need for an office, so I never got one. So in retirement, um, got lucky over the years, had enough money to uh, to buy this little place. Uh, and I'm uh, going to have it uh, as a venue for events like this, uh, for yeah. small parties, uh, for um, wine tasting events, for weekend art shows, weekend pop-up, whatever for people who can't afford their own uh, retail space can come in, we'll advertise, and they can be here uh, over the weekend. I do not want to give up my personal use of it. I've been using it as a music studio in an office, and I want to be able to continue to do that in conjunction with whoever happens to be using it at the same time. So that's my story. And how do, how do they rent for you? How do they get a hold of you? Well, you know, I've been really remiss in the business department of this whole thing. I've had it for a year, and I still don't have a business card. So the best way is to knock on the front door. <laughs> Old school. Uh, and I can't get my business phone to work. So that gives you an idea where I am technologically. Um, but leave me a note on the front door, put it in the mail slot, and leave me your number, and I'll get back to you. Thank you. thank you, Robert. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Leo Sleeman has a uh, local company called Labris, and they uh, do, um, I guess, emergency response, predictive emergency response uh, for uh, organizations such as government organization. Nevada County currently licenses their uh, product, and so it's help actually helping keep us all safe. 
Um, so that's pretty amazing. He's has a, a, a co-founder and a few of the members uh, of the company here, and they're growing. Uh, I think they have licenses in, in other areas as well. So it's it's pretty um, amazing. And Leo has been really at the ground floor of helping Sierra Commons in this tech um, program that I've been talking about, trying to get more startups happening in our area. Uh, so much appreciated to him. A Berkeley grad. Um, my son, I don't know how, I don't know how old Leo is, but my kids, uh, more my kids age than my age. So uh, that's what we're looking for is like uh, innovation here. And um, Leo is in the next wave of that type of innovation in Nevada County. And he's online. Did I do a fair job? I don't know if you were paying attention. Uh, Absolutely. From, from what I got, I think that was great. Okay. Uh, Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so again, Liz, we present this company, and then we're going to have some uh, conversation about uh, impact to society on AI. Yes? Yes. All right. That's the plan. Take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, so much for having me, uh, Ms. Robert. Very Generously introduced, my name is Leo Zuman. Um, I'm the, one of the co-founders and uh, CEO of our uh, AI uh, startup, uh, Ladders. We started the company a little while ago, me and actually another local here from uh, Nevada County. Uh, we grew up here, we went to NU, uh, went to Berkeley, it's where we started the company, and then we're, we're back. Um, and we're fortunate to be able to put a lot of those applications to work here in the county and in, in other places as well. So. Uh, what we're going to do here is going to go through a little bit about our story, um, you know, the problems we're trying to solve and how we fit in the kind of the bigger landscape of AI. And then, as Robert mentioned, I think in the second half of the presentation, we'll kind of go to where we see AI going in the future, um, how this, what this means for everybody, right? Uh, oh my God, thanks. So, happy to be here and I'm looking forward to getting started. So, big data, um, as we've thought about here, is, is sort of the future, right? Um, and it's what underlies the need for all of the kind of AI applications that um, Ethan just went through. Um, and it's what powers it as well, right? Trained on huge amounts of information generated by the internet and the people on the internet over the last 20 years. Without this, none of those models you know, could exist, right? So ChatGPT, Dolly, all those learn from watching what we've done. You know, the art we've produced, the text we've produced, um, and that's what enables them to sound so human and, and uh, create stuff that appears to be so fundamentally like of, of humanity, right? Um, and so we fit in here uh, looking at that data warehousing piece, right? Because there's so much information out there. And one of the things that we do really well as people that um, ChatGPT and others can't quite do yet um, is we can, you know, I could probably ask any of you, what will you do tomorrow? And you could probably tell me. Um, and that ability to take in pretty much all the information that you've ever known and come up with an answer in a split second is still something that eludes artificial intelligence. So that's kind of the goal of AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence, is to produce something that might approximate that behavior, right? So in order for that to happen, we have to be able to give those machines the ability to think about all the data, right? Not just a subset of it. Um, and that's, you know, one of the trends that we see in the space, right? Um, so, as I mentioned, you know, what's enabled this kind of recent explosion now is the trends for the last 20 years. Um, the internet was um, huge for this because it enabled all this generation to happen in a place, in one single place, really, that could be read and studied and learned about um, by anybody with a search engine and now by the machines that can search the internet as well. Um, and so although big data has been around for a long time, it doesn't necessarily mean it's been usable. Right, um, and so that's why tons and tons of companies, and pretty much every company and government out there, is investing in, you know, a means of analyzing that information. Um, and how we how can we get those applications to have a practical form, right, and answer these questions that we have. So the problem with that, um, and you know, there's a lot of companies competing to solve this problem. Right, there's tons of companies out there. Some of which you've probably heard of recently, if you're ever an SF. Uh, Snowflake has a billion advertisements. Um, uh, Databricks makes the news a lot, uh, you know, and obviously Tableau, Salesforce now, um, and then the usual, you know, incumbents, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, um, all trying to work on that stuff too, right? So it's it's a big problem, and there's a lot of big players trying to solve it. 
the issue with a lot of this is that uh, we still haven't really found a good way to integrate all that data, right? There's tons and tons of information out there that some of which is on the internet, but lots of which is not. Um, lots of which is kind of in private sources or it's just unstructured and there's no really clear way of representing it. And so it's expensive to put that all in the database, basically. It's really expensive um, in terms of time and, and money. And a lot of it's done by hand. Like a lot of it's done by somebody, sort of like the man behind the screen, like doing like the coding, um, you know, to get all that stuff in. Um, no matter how much it's advertised as being a kind of a fluent process. Um, the people who train ChatGPT, for example, OpenAI, you know, spent thousands of hours training it, manually sitting back and forth and saying, okay, like answer the question a little bit more like this. This is how a human answers that question, right? And so there's a ton of work that goes into producing these big data models. Um, and there's really no automated way of doing that. So the unit economics are on this from a business standpoint sort of break down. And even the large scale incumbents haven't really found a way to automate that away. And unless we do, it'll be hard to get um, this kind of technology to everybody, right? OpenAI is a great example of one of the first companies really doing that. And they are the product of, I think, seven years of research into that space, funded by you know, the billionaire luminaries of Silicon Valley, like Teal and Hoffman and all those guys, right? Came in 2015, started OpenAI, and it's a company that exists in a very particular space that could not have existed um, in almost any other market in any other way. But it does, and it gives us the ability to do some of the things that people are showing, which is great. So this is kind of where we step in. Um, we, you know, started basically the company mostly because we kind of, you know, we saw that there's a lot of this big data AI stuff going on and we thought, well, you know, we feel like we can contribute. Um, we think this is interesting, it's something we want to work on. Uh, so my co-founder and I, um, who I've known for many, many years, uh, grew up here, as I mentioned, um, we started the company while in school, uh, you know, just because it was something we were interested in, right? No business experience, no business plan. Uh, very much engineering focused. Uh, we had some cool technology, um, which we did get a patent for. And basically, um, our core contribution was, okay, how can we take some of you know, all that data out there, whether it's images or text or videos, um, and represent it all in the same way, right? So that conceivably, you could train a really large neural net um, or another kind of AI model, all, all that information at once, right? To answer that fundamental question of, what are you gonna do tomorrow, right? What, how can you synthesize all that information into you know, your average question and answer scenario. Um, and this was, you know, this was a lot of fun. Uh, it, was, it was great for us, but then we graduated and we had to work. Um, so we had to start making money. Um, so we learned kind of the business element at that time. And we benefited immensely, by the way, from the community here. So um, we went through, you know, the SBDC, um, the Sierra Business Council, um, obviously worked extensively with Sierra Commons here as well. Um, and other groups um, and kind of local community members that have done this kind of thing before. It turns out there's a big community, um, you know, here from sort of the tech industry and stuff. And um, we benefited immensely from their experience. And we put together, you know, a business plan and uh, started going to market. And uh, so far, it's worked out great. We've been able to do this full time. Um, you know, we raised some financing. We, uh, you know, cash flows and all that good stuff, right? So, um, and now what we do uh, is we focus on kind of two key value propositions, right? So one is, how do you integrate all that data into one place? If you have models that you want to train, how do you do that quickly? Um, and the other is running those models, right? So those models are very useful for many things, as uh, Ethan was demonstrating, um, both in terms of generation, right? So you can do images, new text, you don't have to pay someone to do that. Um, you can tweak it any number of ways. You can write code with it. Um, and then prediction, what's gonna happen next, right? Sort of what can we see about the future that we don't know today, and can we make changes now that will um, you know, make things better down the road, right? And so we've traditionally fit in on the predictive side, um, although we do have applications that are, that are using it for generation <laughs> as well. Um, and today we're fortunate to be used kind of um, across California and actually a little bit beyond now um, for uh, modeling situations that happen in the future, uh, predictive AI, right, for future, uh, future conditions. So, for example, um, and we'll take a look at this here. Uh, let me see if I have this pulled up. Um, this is a little video that will kind of just run on a loop. So we have uh, deployed our software for county governments, like Nevada County, Orange County, Ventura County, and others. Um, that basically uh, let them simulate the impacts of evacuations, right? So they can take any sort of population that they have 
and they can set certain initial conditions, much like you would with another model, right? So what does the population look like? What does the departure time frame look like? Um, if there's construction on the roads, what does that do? You know, how do we vary our base conditions? Um, what if we build new houses, build new roads? Um, what if the wind changes direction? All of these kind of what if questions. And they can run and they can get answers, basically, that are very granular and very quantitative on what that's going to look like in a real event, right? So that's one example of a use case that we have. It's also used um, by environmental consulting firms for a lot of the kind of new housing projects, new housing developments that they're building, right? So if we drop in this new uh, infrastructure, what does that do to our network? Uh, for utilities companies, we're all gonna switch to be, you know, probably electric cars at some point in the next 50 years. Can the grid handle that, right? What is that going to do? You know, another kind of what if question. So, um, and then of course, there's the human element too, right? Uh, we want to make sure that communities have means to keep people safe um, and answer these kind of questions that allow them to collaborate. And it turns out AI is actually really good for that because it's putting a lot of that data sort of on a common playing field that organizations can then share and use together. Um, and what was once a very static, very expensive process that took nine months you know, can now be automated away in a matter of seconds, um, which is really quite good for the humans on the other end of the desk, right? Um, because it lets them do more of their job in a shorter amount of time. Um, so, you know, this is, this is gonna go on for like, you know, five or six minutes, but it's just an example of some of the work that we do, and you'll notice that a large part of that focuses on the data piece. Because um, we believe that without exposing all the underlying data to the people that are working with these models, you can't really have the best of both worlds, which is that the local knowledge of the people actually running the, mo of the models for their particular use case is leveraged in those models. So let's say you are a, um, an emergency manager, um, you know, or a sheriff's attendant at uh, county government. You know, you probably don't have tons of training in AI, you know, as, as sort of like a, just as a guess, right? Um, and in fact, most companies that do, they have these huge data science teams, $50 million, $100 million budgets, um, and if you have a PhD and you know how to use data science, then these models are really great, right? But one of the trends that we're seeing recently, um, again, uh, as the initial demonstration showed, um, is these models are now being opened up to a whole swath of individuals that don't have that training, right? It's like, you know, folks that, that might not know actually how to build those models, but can now use them, uh, which is fantastic. And so that's a large part of what we try to do here is get these trained AI models to an audience that um, might traditionally not have access to them because those are often the folks that need them most right, to answer these very practical questions that can really benefit um, you know, a lot of people. So um, that's kind of the, the high level spiel uh, there. Uh, we'll just kind of go ahead and pause this. And what I'd like to do now, um, if it's all right, is kind of just open this up uh, for questions a little bit about what Ladris does. If there's anything I can talk about, answer, go into more detail on. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned in the second half, we'll transition to a bigger picture question about like the future of AI. Yes, but you mentioned you were, you were working for the county. Have, mm -hmm. have they looked at the uh, potential hazards of a wildfire or an accident on the, at the mine that they're trying to open, the IML? You know, um, is this a real problem? They're, they're, going, they're going to have to vote on this issue, and I don't think they've really looked at the hazards. That could, I mean, like that cloud in Ohio. Can you guys do that? Yeah, the chemical what's gonna happen at, at chemical yeah so um, we can do that kind of thing. And you know, I I can't speak to whether uh, OES in this case, emergency services, has used um, has used our application for that particular purpose. I mean, we. Well, know, I would think something like this would have to go into the EIR. Probably, probably <coughs> so. Um, and indeed, a lot of the environmental consulting firms that we work with do do produce those EIRs. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is, right, like once we hand it off uh, to the customer, we train them, we support them, but obviously, you know, I, I can't speak necessarily to their exact usage. I would hope that they do use it for analysis exactly like you suggest. Um, and I know that they've been, you know, um, pretty forward in embracing in embracing this kind of technology. We do owe um, Steve uh, Monahan at Nevada County, um, CIO for Nevada County. I mean, it's those kind of progressive early adopters, right, that, um, that enable this technology ultimately to get out to everybody, right? And we're very grateful to that kind of that support there. So great question. Yes, I hope it is being used for that. Um, just we'll just go across it. Yeah. I'm curious to know um, more about how you uh, integrate the data into uh, you said you had a sort of single unified uh, representation. So that's kind of the first part of the question. The second part of the question is whether that's domain specific. Yeah. So great question. Um, 
So it's a it's a sort of a long and complex answer, but the simple um, version of it, which you know we could absolutely do, but um, the simple version of it is, if you have you know you're looking for a common means of representation, right? Ultimately, you know by the time it gets to a model, everything's going to be um, you know machine code basically, right? And that's a that's a great abstraction. I mean that right there, all of all of programming is a remarkable <coughs> abstraction to go from binary all the way up to what we have today. Um, but you know, at the moment, it is very domain specific, and so for us, you know, we actually took a lot of our cues. A lot of it is you know moderately proprietary and, and, and stuff of that nature. But we actually took a lot of our cues from a very um, sort of very obtuse applications uh, while we were while we were in school. Um, and you know, to give a kind of a short overview on how this emerged, right? So database technology traditionally you have two kinds of databases, right? You have SQL databases, relational business databases. Um, which worked fantastic for the time they were created in, in the 1970s. Um, and they're all about business logic, right? How can I get this answer given these constraints? And then in the early 2000s, the internet showed up and we got a lot of unstructured data and it, you know, relational databases didn't work perfectly. So NoSQL databases or not only SQL databases were made to help address this issue. So that was kind of like a dump everything in there and we'll figure it out later approach. Um, and it turns out that the figure it out later part required SQL again. So <coughs> the SQL came back on top of it, and um, you know now that's kind of how databases like Snowflake, MongoDB, that kind of thing is um, uses a little bit of both. And so um, it's you know the short answer is ours is a little bit of a hybrid of the SQL and NoSQL approach, uh, influenced with a, some interesting math and um, some very very obtuse uh, concepts that are able to kind of bake into the architecture of the underlying database, but. Um, that's, yeah, that's kind of largely how it goes. So if I read sorry. your patent, I would, I would learn more? Uh, about the neural net piece, yes. Um, and that kind of represents like a hybridized genetic algorithm neural net approach, but yes. Um, there's probably more in there on that. Although I have to say, they make the patents really damn unreadable. Um, <laughs> it, they, they do a good job of making it, like, I mean, I, I wrote a large chunk of it, and I'm like, I just get it back three years later from the patent, and I'm like, there's no way I could reproduce that even if I wanted to, like even though I made it, I can't do that um, from scratch, right? Uh, so, but yes, uh, be happy to follow up on that more as well. Um, just to answer the second party question, then we'll get to all these um, domain specific applications. Ultimately, it is almost always used in domain specific applications. And the reason is not that it couldn't be used for um, big picture questions. Like, I would love to use it for kind of a Jarvis style assistant like OpenAI is, right? Like, ask it anything and if it's somewhat within the scope of it, it'll give you some information. I'd love to use it for that. Business constraints tend to force it to be used for use cases that are super, super discreet. And that's because if you can use any solution that is not AI and data analytics, you will use that first before you turn to it because it's expensive, time consuming, for all the stuff that we talk about, right? So until the unit economics are better for those use cases, it's probably gonna be point solutions and eventually maybe we get something more general, kind of like computing, right? I mean, at first you got these big mainframes Used for you know planetary calculations and uh, you know nuclear uh, nuclear physics research basically, and then later now we all carry around like there's probably I don't know like 50 of them in this room alone, right? All doing very general stuff. So hopefully that's the way that AI trends, um, but we'll see, right? Um, you I think we're next. Yeah, I wonder like you do wildfire evacuation simulations, and I would just be curious what kind of data sources you're pulling in. I mean topography, road conditions, building patterns. If you could just speak to that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. So um, all of the above that you mentioned are part of it. Um, in addition to that, so yeah, just to restate, so you know, road infrastructure, right? That's a big part of it. Obviously, the weather and disasters themselves uh, plays a role. Um, there's the kind of human elements, which we generally just kind of model away, um, not having a whole bunch of data on like, you know, how people actually would behave in those conditions, very sparse data sets for that. So instead that's kind of represented as more as hyperparameters, right? So that's kind of the, the stuff that you saw Ethan tuning there in the model is kind of um, on that last one, you know how we scale back the answers a little bit to make it a little bit more approachable. That's an example of something where we can't, where we don't have data, we use uh, parameters. Basically our best guess stand-ins um, at influencing the rest of the equation. Uh, so that's kind of how we address the human piece. And then there's also, you know, a lot of it's customer specific, right? So for the uh, EVAC modeling use case, it'll be infrastructure, whether um, if they have, you know, information on vehicles, population, that's, that's useful as well. If they don't, um, then we go without it. Uh, but then for other use cases, it'll be, it'll be entirely different data sources, right? Um, 
but yeah, I mean, ultimately you can group most things in the infrastructure or the, the environment, right? I mean, that's gonna be a lot of it. So. so do you guys add the source, concentrations, <clears throat> dispersion, uh, transport mechanisms, are those in there? Because I always think that's the, the heart of this thing, right? How do you know how fast something's moving unless you know how concentrated it is at the source? Yeah, so um, absolutely, right? So a lot of the, in that case, like, so these kind of models, in this case, uh, are graph models, which is just to say, uh, you know, a connected series of like nodes and edges. So a road network is a graph, a grid network is a graph, a network is a graph, right? Knowledge graph, that kind of thing. Um, so how fast stuff flows across that graph is a core part of these kind of models, and that's something you're sometimes, in some cases, training other models to figure out what that is. Um, so what are realistic flow conditions, congestion models, that kind of stuff, is something that um, there's a lot of AI model training that goes into that, for example. Um, Do you tap into those transfer learning? Uh, it depends. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a big question. I, I would say, you know, um, in most cases, we do our best to do that where possible. We're limited by, um, like everyone else, the amount of data that's out there, right? Which increases exponentially every year. Um, but ultimately, you know, there's only so high of a level of fidelity that you can reach um, for prediction. I mean, as they say, still, this is still true for predictive models. Um, no model is perfect, but some are useful, right? And so that's kind of always our challenge is where do we, you know, where do we kind of stop having the information and, and kind of cut off the assumptions and say, we're not going to guess about how this is going to look. Um, we're going to open that up as a parameter for other people to guess about, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't be doing our job in making those models. Uh, yeah. So continuing the same example, uh, you say you're working with this huge amount of data, but what about modeling the use of the data? I'm thinking of evacuation, evacuating from Lake Wildwood where I live, which yeah. is a big issue. So are you generating the model of the evacuation itself or just taking in the data suggesting you know what the would be um i would say yeah are we are we generating the model or well, the, for example the the current report that we have was written about three years ago but it makes a very unrealistic assumption yeah. about the average speed that people will drive out of lake wildwood it's, mm -hmm. it's way off right so i don't know where that came from and that probably was just somebody, you know, said we're going to use this. But there are models that model this kind of stuff as well. How do behave, people behave when? So are you tapping into those kinds of models to add it to the data and put these together in some way? Wherever, okay, so thank you for clarifying. Yeah, wherever possible, we do do that, right? So in this specific use case, and we do this for all of our use cases, um, we try to assemble a, you know, a team of, domain experts um, that have built some of these models, right? So for evacuations, we're fortunate to work with uh, people like Todd Kova, um, perhaps one of the foremost traffic modeling experts, um, at least in the US, he's a professor in Utah, he does a bunch of uh, these kind of models, basically, to answer that question. And that's what's necessary in all of these kind of big picture questions, is you have a lot of models that are overlapping, right? And it's in the overlap where we want to kind of open that up and say, how much do they overlap? How much does the human behavior really influence the course of these events? Um, how much does you know the fundamental constraints of the network, for example, prevent that from happening? Right. These are these are open questions in the field, and we feel our job is to, to give everyone the tools to experiment with it. Right. And then you can do things like run, you know, Monte Carlo simulations or grid searches where you run like a billion models and see, oh, 99 percent of the time, 95 percent of the time, there's peak congestion on this exact stretch of road. Maybe we should mitigate things there. So in general, it sounds like you're working not only with big data, but many uh, kinds of models of how this data is manipulated. And you're sitting on top of that and pulling all that together. Yep, that's, yeah. that's, generally, that's generally what we do. Yeah, it's a good, you know, it's a good, good question. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a, a personal question. For sure. Um, is there an example of an uh, emergency situation where you know that your software was, your product was used? And if so, just as a, a founder or co-creator of this, how, how was that experience for you knowing that it was yeah. an emergency situation? Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's a good feeling, um, thankfully. I mean, uh, so uh, one good example of this actually is so Truckee. Um, Truckee also is a customer of ours. Um, separate from the county, though they are part of the county, you know, they kind of overlap with Placer, but that's really their own thing going on. Um, and during the Mosquito Fire, uh, you know, this past year, um, thankfully it didn't reach Truckee, but it, you know, was projected to go up the hill for quite a way. So they, 
um, rewrote their evacuation plans uh, three days in advance. They did it all in 12 hours. They ran you know, tons and tons of different scenarios and prepared the town you know, for an evacuation that had they started when they expected to have started, you know, would have been uh, very, very difficult to execute on correctly. Uh, and instead they were able to do it, you know, seeing those changing conditions pretty much uh, right when they needed to. Wow. And it conceivably could have, you know, saved the town if, if things had gone in the worst case direction. Um, we're very happy that they didn't. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, that obviously was a, sort of a pretty crazy experience is, you know, look, looking at, having seen it grow through its whole life cycle from a academic abstraction of a big data concept to something that's, you know, saving people's lives was uh, pretty fulfilling for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys do you guys generate conclusions as to how many deaths can accrue uh, based on a certain kind of accident, like say faux pas or something like that, or a nuclear accident like in Japan, Fukushima? Can you guys do that and give us like what is the rate of how many deaths we're looking at, how many how many people injured? Well, um, I mean you can ex you can probably extrapolate that information if you want to. Uh, we. That, I mean, it's not to say that you couldn't model that. We sort of leave that final determination just because of the sort of the weight of that number to the emergency services departments to make that, you know, if they want to make that extrapolation, there's, there's probably means of doing that. But, um, but yeah, we sort of, we stop at the point of execution, right? And we do emphasize this as a value proposition in general. Models are most, you know, most useful in advance. Um, if you're using it by the time the event's happening, we really hope that you also ran models ahead of time, generally speaking, or train models ahead of time or have those scenarios planned. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, we, um, that's absolutely an application that someone's using something like this for that somewhere. I can guarantee that um, at the federal level. I wouldn't think it'd be hard to extend. I mean, you have, if you have the source, you have the distribution, you have the number of population, LD50 or whatever concentration is not hard. <coughs> How do you think about the accuracy of what your output looks like? Uh, and is there um, liability or vulnerability for mistakes that are reached by the circumstances here or you know, consequences? Yeah, so um, a super, super important question. It's something we think about a lot, obviously. <laughs> um, we definitely spend a, spend a lot of time considering this one. So. Um, it depends in a large part on the events or scenario you're trying to follow, right? So for, um, let's just take traffic for example, right? So for people going to work, well they do that every day, twice a day, you know, for a long, long time now. Um, so there's a huge sample from looking at that and back testing. For some events like evacuations or other, you know, black swan events as they, as they call them, or black swan for a reason that no one expected them, it's impossible to, you know, really, um, benchmark, like they are by definition an anomaly. So um, that makes it very hard to backtest, admittedly, uh, very difficult to do. The best way that we've found to address that, there's a couple ways that we address that. One of them is by, you know, sort of taking an Occam's razor approach and not over assuming what we don't have to, right? So we, as much as possible, try not to make those um, final critical modeling assumptions hard code. We try to open those parameters up because only in looking at the complete range of possibilities can you find the things that are most likely. I mean, if we are, for example, to hard code the flow rate in, uh, as an example, um, you know, that's pretty limiting to the sample space of all the things that could occur, right? So maybe what we do instead is we'll say, okay, um, you know, we have deployed it for county XYZ. We know they've had three or four of these kind of very anomalous events. Um, how closely are the projections aligning? If we, if we went back in time and ran that same model for that event, you know, just boilerplate, how, does, how closely does that align, right? And we don't want to have, you know, confirmation bias. There's a whole field of study around, um, including in the way animals are trained to avoid exposing it to the stuff that you're going to predict on. You don't want to have leakage there. Um, time series data becomes really important because you don't want to have information from the future that you're trying to predict filter into the past training results. And then, wow, it gets really good at predicting something you already trained it on, right? So that is a... Um, that by itself is a very critical use case of having proper data versioning and stuff like that. So um, basically, you know, we do our best to, uh, to test against what we know. And for what we can't uh, safely 
validate and look at, we open it up as a parameter. Um, and ultimately, that's about as good as you can do um, for a lot, of, um, a lot of models. It just really depends on the data and the sample size that you have. Uh, the second way we address it is by opening all the information up to the sort of the boots on the ground folks, right? the ones that actually call and execute these events, um, and the ones that plan for them, we sort of put them in the best position to be able to inject their local knowledge into these things, right? Because ultimately, um, and we like to, I like to say this all the time, right? I mean, the best neural net that there is, is the guy who's been running these for 20 years, right? The guy who's been in this area, knows his community um, for evacuations in particular. A lot of the way, you know, a lot of the way that's emerged is this kind of like deep set local knowledge. Um, if we're not leveraging that, we're making a mistake, right? Because there's a lot of training that's gone in, literally just like a neural net trains, you know, that's already gone in there, right? So we, as another model, for example, that we have access to, it's the human model, right? The model of the guys that have done this. Um, and that's true of virtually any predicted use case that you look at, whether it's the stock market, which is very hard to predict, or um, supply chains, right? So, yeah. Does that kind of help answer that question? It's a very complicated process, but we do spend a lot of time uh, back testing and working with other models like human. You know, models. I think a better question would have been do you associate a probability of accuracy with the answers that you're generating? Uh, we do, in the sense that every answer is, um, you know, one of many, right? So there's no, it's, it's uh, if you're running kind of micro simulation models, you're generating a, a range of possibilities every time. And so, you, you know, you can basically say, well, here's the average, here's the standard deviation, here's the median, here's all the, here's all the outcomes with slight variations. These ones show up the most often. Under most conditions, this will probably be, probably being keyword, you know, be what occurs, probably being bound by a normal distribution or some other kind of distribution. And that's, you know, that's kind of how it works for stats in general, right? Um, so yeah. extending that for a second, mm -hmm. can, you, can you sum all the probabilities for all the scenarios multiplied by the consequences of each one and get your risk model that way? That's the way they used to do it, I don't know. Yeah, you can, um, absolutely. And that's useful for other applications like, um, uh, uh, you know, like vegetation management and other things like that, where it's really kind of like, there's no one answer, but you'd really like to know like what the sort of best approach is most of the time. So summing or, or just looking at the count of how many, you know, how many times is this ranked super high or ranked a little bit lower. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with these multi-point models, basically. Um, I want to make sure I get your question before. Uh, yes, uh, a Dutch researcher in um, geophysical research uh, predicted exactly a 7.5 earthquake in Turkey and tweeted it three days before at the exact magnitude um, with uh, relevant data on plate tectonics. I'm wondering is um, your application going to be able to do that at some point or is already? Um, well, that specific use case, I mean, I can't say. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously that's an extremely tragic event and um, <laughs> You know, that's very, very, very unfortunate. Uh, we hope to be able to contribute toward uh, preventing um, and mitigating the, the impacts of those kind of events in the future, for sure. Um, um, and I have a um, uh, follow-up on that question. Um, and in case that there is such a earthquake at that level, can you also predict the, um, the ability of buildings to withstand that uh, kind of an earthquake or um, a measure of their collapse and um, breakdown? Um, so although although there are digital twin type models that uh, you know are being developed to address those kind of questions, it's not currently a use case that we address um, at the moment. So it's, it's hard to say. Uh, that's actually one of the, when we're looking at applications for where do we go, you know, where do we go next? Do we allocate resources like business resources to focus on this problem or that problem, um, there's kind of, uh, there's a whole consideration that goes into it from a unit economic standpoint, and actually all these things have to get distilled into a financial model for a vertical at some point, right? So it has to go back to paper. Um, but two of the considerations are, um, is it, uh, you know, feasible? And then is it even possible um, at all, right? So feasibility, if we threw enough money at it, could it be solved, right? And then tractability or possibility, um, you know, is there any amount that actually allows you to solve that? Like maybe, maybe it's just not really a question that, that can be answered with the kind of models that we have. And that's always something that we have to we have to look at and like ask ourselves very honestly, like, can this really be predicted? You know, with any useful degree of accuracy. Um, 
Because sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> like, not, no matter how much money you could throw at it, I mean, there's a reason that some of these things are just beyond the limits of current technology. Um, maybe not forever, but at least for now. In um, business, they have something called price of, uh, or cost of perfect information. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? You, you can figure out what that is and then realize whether or not you, you can afford it or even do it? Well, as, as we like to say, right, you know, our job is to kind of make uh, the best decisions we can with imperfect information in the same vein as, as that theory. Um, but assuming that we don't have perfect information, uh, looking just at the kind of the constraints of the, the question that we're being asked to solve, um, you know, there are, there are some tools that will just never work to answer that kind of question. Right. Um, at least for now, I mean, you can think of many examples of this, but uh, it's, you know, like square peg and round hole type thing. It's got to fit, right? It's got to be the right tool for that particular application. Back to um, your question about uh, domain-specific use cases. So much of it does come back to that. Even with these really powerful language models that they're coming out with now, right? Chad GPT and others, um, you know, there, there are limits. There are limits to the things that these things can do. Right? Um, just, yeah, you don't think you have a question? Um, I'm wondering, in your experience, what is the level of adoption by California energy companies and organizations like CAL FIRE? Because, I mean, you can obviously see lots of uh, uses, you know, in, in not only um, electricity, but in hydrology, balancing that. What is your experience? Are, are they using these tools? Are they using similar tools? Or is it just still emerging? Yes, great question. Um, so, uh, very topical. I was just at a utilities conference uh, yesterday um, where, you know, ourselves and a number of, a number of other uh, software vendors were um, talking about this, this exact kind of thing. So they are definitely, um, either some of them are actively using tools like this or they are looking at using tools like this. Um, but again, the kind of big, the big hurdle, the big question for a lot of these companies is, um, it comes down to the unit economics, right? Because you can have, you know, big questions that you want to solve, but if that solution costs you $20 million to implement after you've integrated all the data, I mean, that's not going to happen for a while, right? And so we are in the early days of getting those unit economics low enough to the point where you can have, oh, this is a really good application of AI is a cheap solution for it. We're not there yet, that's where we want to be. Um, in the same way now that you know most questions you answer are like oh we can totally make an app for that or that's a great thing to Google, um, you know imagine imagine kind of asking those questions in like the 1960s or 1970s like and that would be uh, a much more expensive proposition to build the whole infrastructure around to solve that one problem right so they are kind of grappling you know with a lot of questions that are super domain specific but at the core of a lot of them just is you know what's the what's the cost benefit analysis here like can we um, what are the best questions to solve with this technology? But they're absolutely looking at it, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, back to the original uh, use type, construction type, uh, seismic risk, uh, risk type are all very readily available in uh, public databases, uh, even with uh, soil. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it would segue very easily into uh, public safety and your models that you're using for uh, the data category for others, uh, you for flood or fire or earthquake. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. That, that is very true. Um, you know, we, we're always looking for additional data. Um, you know, sometimes there is sort of a limiting reagent, so to speak, right? And sometimes some data ends up mattering more than, than other data. Um, and we also look at you know the cost to develop data pipelines and that kind of thing. Because um, once those are up and once people are relying on that information, uh, it has to keep coming. It has to keep getting updated. Um, you know if that's what the models rely on. So, um, but yeah, we're absolutely looking at data sources much like that for this and, and other applications. Just I think next week we're going to be talking with one of the environmental consulting firms on um, a project that will probably use a lot of the kind of data that you're talking about. And OpenStreetMap is also available too, which is constantly being updated. Certainly. Um, no, the, uh, again, the internet changed the game for all of this, and you know, none of what we do or what any of these companies do is impossible without that first step, in my opinion. Thank you. Of course. Go ahead, and then And then how about these two that we just kind of... Yeah, we'll segue to the kind of the broader yeah. topic. Okay. Unless we're over some, I don't know. What no, that's good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Go ahead, please. Thanks. So I'm, uh, I'm just kind of following the metal model in my 
head of, of uh, what Ladris does. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is my best effort so far, uh, which is that, uh, so you you found a collection of, or you, you, you curate a collection of models um, and uh, which have to do with, you know, traffic patterns, uh, density of housing, all the things that, that you think uh, would be uh, that are relevant to an evacuation, right? Uh, probably on land, um, and and then you have a way of um, integrating. You probably have some sort of meta model that ties all these other models together, um, and you provide enough uh, uh, knobs for the, as you say, the domain experts, the you know, the OES or, or whoever, to say actually. You know, on Nevada County roads, traffic only moves at this speed, right? Because we're not on a grid, and it's it's hilly here, it's not flat. Um, although you could also have a model that would that you could plug in, and then um, you use that that kind of um, you, 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 your your domain experts can then put in values into this sort of large meta model that you have, and then you can. Then you can kind of push the button, and it will then it will generate a simulation, or a, a, from what I saw from the maps there, it looked as though you had like traffic flow and things like that, and their uh, roads were color coded presumably with traffic density. Um, is 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 so when um, uh, my friend over here mentions you know earthquake, so if you could if if you could get models that had you know were to do with earthquakes and building. You know, resilience and so forth. You could plug those in, and they would go underneath your kind of meta model, and then you, know, you might then discover that you know more roads would be out because these buildings would collapse with a certain size of. of a, is is that kind of a, a fair general? Is that is that kind of an accurate description of what Ladris is? Yes, I would say that's that's pretty spot on. Um, I would add critically. Uh, these kind of, you know, these kind of analyses, if you had enough money, you, had, you know, you've been able to do these for a long time, but uh, companies and governments without highly, highly, highly trained end users haven't been. And so our kind of core, I guess, business innovation, right, beyond the technical innovation is put these models in the hands of end users that are very close to the source and can use them for practical applications um, in the same way that you know, back in the 60s, 70s, like, you know, computing was the domain of a, of a privileged few, and now everyone, or as many people as possible, have access to it. We hope we can do something similar uh, with AI and, and the kind of value they can create as well. So, but yeah, great summary. So I was wondering, where do you get your train, training data? Do you actually go to places like in the south where there's a lot of tornadoes? that cause traffic problems, because you know for beforehand what's gonna happen and you can get this panic uh, simulated in, in your old address. Is, is that where you do get your training data from places like that that have these catastrophes happen? Well, I'm just uh, curious because it, yeah. it, it's so big, I just have no idea what you're using as far as, are you using deep neural net or using uh, some other aspect of AI, more, more textual? Yeah, so um, to answer the first part of your question, um, basically, you know, it'll depend on the area. Obviously, for these kind of models that depend so much on specific local dynamics, cities are really different than Nevada County, um, which in turn looks really different than, uh, you know, comparatively even more rural county in, let's say, somewhere like Texas or something like that. Um, we, we try to tailor it as much to the general type of, of area that's, that's being modeled, because you're going to have just really different dynamics place to place. Um, or small communities that have that are kind of nestled up against the hill, you know, uh, the Sun Valley or Mill Valley, a great example of that. Um, you know, it it depends a lot on who they are. So, rather than having sort of a general, um, a single place that we look for for that information, you know, we'll try to get as, as make it as tailored as possible to something similar to the actual area and really on a more abstract level, the actual problem that we're modeling. That makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the thought is you want to look to see what can be for, um, as it gives you your best guess at what might happen next. So, of course, not always. Yeah, a very, it's a very kind of complex question. So training data comes from everywhere. 
to uh, are, you're actually training this AI. You could say, you know, um, the information comes from a lot of different places, but how it's used is often very specific. That would be the, probably the best way to answer that question. Um, yeah, and then, sorry, you just want to get one more question in here, just uh, go, go for it. It's more of a generic question, uh, not to do with your company, but with AI. Um, you mentioned that you're going to work with AI. That's a great segue. We'll, okay. just, we'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I'm wondering about, like, workforce and talent, like, what kind of skills do you need to be in this? because it's gonna it's blowing up already right and you're gonna need a lot of people working and also um, I have a second question which is if chat GPT can code now does my son need to learn how to code what does he do I mean he's going for classes now yeah what is he supposed to learn yeah well these these are great questions yeah the, the broader uh, subject so thank you um, so let's see, multi-part question here. So for the first part of that, um, let's see, I got so caught what up in the second What are the skills? One. What are the skills yeah. required to, yeah. like, to do the right right yeah. now? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's there's a range of, of different ways, I think, that you can have an impact on the technology right now. So um, obviously there's the, there's the programming aspect, right? Um, and that's for the foreseeable future, you know, at some point, Maybe it'll write itself, um, but not quite yet. Not quite yet. Uh, so until that happens, it's absolutely good to know, you know, how to how to do that kind of engineering. Um, I guess does that kind of focus in on just kind of the, the first part of the question, just like to be in the Is it like a combination? Right? Like, do you personally, for example, you and your founder have skills around uh, software development, statistics? Yeah. I mean, okay. What, so like, what, what, yeah. what are the yeah. So um, I'm probably the wrong person to answer actually that question because I majored in Arabic and history <laughs> and <laughs> so, uh, very different, very non-math majors. Uh, my father was fortunate he's a nuclear astrophysicist. I had a lot of math and programming when I grew up, so uh, I'm on my way to a, a different way. Um, my co-founder applied math major in physics and more traditional track stuff. Uh, but but yeah, I mean all of it's math. Okay. All of it's math, yeah. right? So like all of this is an abstraction on mathematical concepts. Um, you know, which is what makes math such an interesting topic um, in general. So you know, that's that I can guarantee is is probably a way to be pretty close to the source. Um, okay. The more math that you because he was asking what so. kind of jobs can he get if he likes math. So there you yeah, go. Yeah. Well, it's. Um, <laughs> Certainly, certainly gonna, you know, I think a perpetually relevant occupation, but, you know, just having a sort of a non-traditional path to it. Um, I can say with uh, absolute confidence uh, that we would never have come to the particular type of database architecture solution that we came to had I also majored math. It's a, from completely a different space, a different highly way. philosophically bound. Um, and, you know, again, kind of tying it way back to the original discussion, that's the human element still. Right. This can't replicate. Is that what did you bring to it? Um, the the technology or the company? You say you never would have had this agreement oh. with this company. You have the math guy, but if you had been a math guy, you weren't. So what did you bring? Uh, yeah. So I mean, I suppose. Um, so I owe a lot to my, my co-founders, of course. Uh, I would say that you know, from a company perspective, um, a lot of it is just continuing on. Right? You just need to iterate and iterate, 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 iterate until you get to some point that it works. Um, and that happens to be you know, a, a strong point of mine is uh, persistence and iteration. Um, so, you know, as in my role with the company, I sort of do a lot of different things um, and touch like a lot of different aspects of the business, probably almost every aspect of the business um, in some way or another. But originally, um, I would say that you know, it was the desire to do this. This is something we wanted to do. It was something, you know, I felt strong Well, about. the CEO needs to go get clients, right? Well, I was going to say, I, I didn't... And the investment money, 95% of the And the investment, yeah. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. Oh, not at all. <laughs> that question, but it, it came out of something that I was listening to just recently, talking about having wide diversity mm -hmm. in a group of people yeah. is critical, and how um, Deepak Chopra, who was a physician, among other things, Takes, pl uh, takes part in these medical panels where a bunch of specialists get together to figure out how do you solve this particular
hypochondriac cancer. Mm -hmm. But his group includes a poet, a musician, a mathematician, you know, as well as a doctor, and they always get the answer. You know, it's it's much better to have that kind of diversity. When you said Arabic, I thought. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> you know, I have to say, um, yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of the concepts that we drew on in designing um, the architectures that we originally designed, um, you know, some some of which are patented, and some of which remain just trade secrets. Definitely um, had influences from some of those other fields of study, yeah, uh, for sure. And I would say, I you know, humbly brought that to the table um, in, in what way that it, that it made sense at the time, right? Um, what yeah. what tools did you guys use? Did you use a TensorFlow or or a Torch or which ones? Um, so yeah, I mean, for the neural nets, those, those are great. Those are great for that. Um, you know, there's, but is that what you guys use? Well, yeah, we use a bunch of models. So neural nets are one of them, uh, absolutely. But also. Uh, you know, there's really interesting research in a lot of fields, genetic algorithms, for example. Um, some of the other kind of more graph-based models, which are, you could argue, are also kind of neural models in that way. Um, there's a whole, like I said, uh, there's kind of a whole range of models, some of which are good for solving some kinds of problems, some of which aren't. Um, you know, and it just depends on the answers that you're looking for. But what kind of tools did we use specifically? I mean, I have to say a lot of it's just mathematical frameworks, right? Like you have a representation, you have an idea in your head about how you want to solve this problem. And a lot of it's just, you know, breaking that out into steps and whether that's relying on pre-built, you know, state models from a high torch or a TensorFlow or something like that, or, or whether it is, um, you know, building something that, that doesn't really have that kind of precedent and then training it a lot. Uh, it's, again, to your point, a lot of it's, a lot of it's just math. Uh, which isn't to say you can't do this, as perhaps I demonstrated, if you if you don't have a degree in that, which I, which I certainly do not. Um, but I just kind of fell into it very, very happily. Yeah. Mm -hmm, Robert? Uh, <clears throat> so you mentioned a couple of times about, you know, back in the 70s, and there's a select few people that have computers and have a one more powerful computer in their hand right, mm -hmm. right yeah. now. Yeah. So flash forward five years from now, or like, what what is that? How does that impact our lives? How do you see that impacting our lives? Yeah, well, you know, five years, in, in five years, I'm not sure that even then, that a lot of these generative models will really be kind of, um, you know, all, the, all that we dream them to be, perhaps. Um, in 50 years, in 20 years, something like that, I mean, absolutely. Um, it's, what's really interesting, and I think this is a great kind of opportunity to join your second question, which I, sorry, I didn't quite get to answering, but yours, um, which is where do we fit in, in in where this is going? How does that look like for us and for other people? Um, you know, and I think that ultimately, I mean, right, in some ways things don't change a ton. Um, it's the same kind, we have the same constraints. We, I assume, have the same kind of uh, motivations and constraints and curiosities and, um, you know, there's always new people being born that will bring new ideas and so forth to the table, which is, which is great, it's, you know, a big uh, value add that we bring to the table is this constant generation. Um, but where AI is going to be, you know, I guess you could say that it, it probably means that you still have a lot of people solving a lot of problems that old humans can solve for a long time. It's just what those problems are are going to be very different than they are today. Um, and perhaps they'll be solving more of them faster than they've ever solved before, um, at a, you know, at a faster speed of iteration. Um, and I think in general that's kind of where we are right now. I like to say, like, uh, you know, is it 5,000 years ago? We had, think of it this way, right? Like you know, a million, two million years ago, you know, we show up, we're, we're around um, in kind of a present like, homo sapien type form. Um, 5,000 years ago, we get writing. And, you know, we spent all of that time up till getting writing, and boom, you know, like we're here, right? The universe is 13 billion or so, you know, years old, roughly something like that. Um, and we did all this in 5,000 years, very tiny, short time. So if you look at it in like big picture timelines, we're kind of, you know, growing like bacteria in a petri dish. Um, and computers, we've only had, we haven't even had those for 100 years, and look how far things have come. But AI is perhaps a similar paradigm shift, but it's an exponential growth all the way up, even way back to, you know, the beginnings of civilization. Um, and it's cool to be around for that, to be a kind of a breakneck part of the curve, which is by definition going to continue breaknecking. Um, so, you know, it's a... Uh, it's really, really hard to say, but I think that it's, you know, we'll still be solving problems, they'll just be different ones. And we solve today and at a faster pace than before. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Since we're talking about predictive models, of course, everybody's saying, oh my God, what are the copywriters going to do? Legal briefs, medical, all of those impacts on jobs. People are, but not only, I'd, I'd like to talk, just ask about not only those specific um, changes in the workforce, but bigger picture around what do we do? What do all of those people do now their time is freed up? What just predictive models of, and, and it's all conjecture, I get that. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of fun philosophically to play with what we're talking, these are major jobs, I mean, legal briefs, wow. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, no, right. it's, a, it's a great consideration. Um, as one of my uh, personal favorite uh, attorneys likes to say, you know, contracts, for example, are a meeting of the minds, right? So um, it's, you know, trying to understand, beyond just writing the document, trying to really understand what the motivations and, and you know, issues are for the person on the other end of the table. and. What these models that we have today represent is sort of the, um, the the kind of lower level of abstraction of actually taking that, those ideas, and putting them to paper. But the ability to empathize and to synthesize and to have that kind of reflexive, um, you know, being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, that literally very human empathy, as we have to say. Um, I mean, there are no models for that at the moment. Um, and so, Ironically, perhaps like the best thing to do in you know this sort of age of automation and AI is to continue being very human um, and you know understanding and empathizing with people and trying to put yourself in their shoes wherever possible. I really do think that that's a, a way to differentiate now and for sure in the future. Yeah. Um, it's also I will say more fun to work with people like that. Having worked with a range of folks, it's way more fun. Mm -hmm. to work with the so, yeah. Other questions, um, ideas? What are the ethics around like data sources, right? So where's ChatGPT getting into the room? Where's Dolly getting into the info? You know, we're talking about copywriters, right? Like a copywriter is always going to know his audience, you know, over ChatGPT. But where, where's the ethics around this? We always know that tech can be used as a force of good, but it can also be detrimental. Yeah, I mean, a super important consideration and one I think that um, originally when they were founded, OpenAI hoped to address. Um, but of course, you know, planets change um, occasionally. Uh, just to add to that, Noam Chomsky says all this stuff is collecting them. It's just, it's just massive copyright infringement, theft. That's what I'm, I'm you know, because I, I have friends who are working in, in digital media. So, you know, they're like, hey, that, you know, they're good stealing my art or you know yeah. i have uh, my sister-in-law who writes you know blog posts um like oh i would you know i can't use a ai generated you know copyright that's going to put me out of a job whereas i see like teachers you know embracing it like hey this is a tool it's going to be here and use it so i but i think more what i'm asking is like what's the ethics around the source Right? Yeah. Like what do we like when I go to Google and I log on, I have a Google account, I know I'm giving Google information. That's kind of the assumption there. But like I can give chat GBT the rights to, to, to read my articles and then spit them out. Yeah, I mean it's a great uh, it's a great question and a really important one, obviously. And um, I, I think I think what it really comes down to is as the ability to generate these kind of things becomes more liquid. And by liquid I mean, you know, in let's say like the the Renaissance times would get like a handful of like great artists or painters and like what they put out is unique by definition because not a whole lot of people are really doing that. Um, so they put out something and by definition it's it's unique and new and great. It's great art. Um, and as we kind of get to these economies of scale and abstractions where you know um, not just the machines but, but people there's so many more people than there uh, than there used to be right producing these things. So one good example that I like to look at is you know, there are more active users on Facebook today than there were people in the world in 1920. <laughs> um, you know, which is pretty insane uh, to think about. And so I guess the question really, you know, comes down to like, you know, what's what's original, right? Which is a question that we've always struggled with philosophically. Um, and this just kind of adds a new spin to the curveball. Uh, you know, there may not really be a great answer for that. Um, but this will certainly generate, as you say, a ton of case law around what is original and what's not. It's the same kind of thing with you know, the kind of crazy, like yesteryear with um, NFTs and, and digital verification and blockchain and all those kind of things. Again, revolving around the question of, you know, what makes you you, what makes something itself, what makes something unique? Um, it's just a big open question. And I can't say the name one's really figured it out, but uh, this is gonna precipitate a lot of those discussions. And I think ultimately that can only be a good thing because we do want to get to 
some sort of workable definition that you know is in largely the best interest we hope of everybody and, and hopefully this accelerates that conversation. So while I don't have the answer, I do think that this is a necessary step on the way to getting to that answer. Is there a group of people that are thinking that? Like who's who, you know, the people on the top that are building the open AI? What I mean they're the they're the ones that are holding the keys right now. So what mm -hmm. What's their what's their viewpoint? I mean, you're in in, in that industry. What what are you seeing right here? The, well, the viewpoint from the copyright office: somebody tried to get a copyright for a, an AI generated picture, and copyright office first said okay, and then they came back and said no, it has to have significant or substantial contribution from a human. So, I'm more worried. Like, what are the <coughs> what are the developers thinking? The people that are creating. Them? Yeah, well, I think in general what you can see, and this is, you know, without commenting on anything, any one company or group of individuals, what you can see is an element of restraint in some regards. You know, there's certainly, there's, you can see that there's thought being had. For example, ChatGPT, right? Um, you know, obviously a reason why there's a lot that you can't ask it, not because it couldn't tell you the answer, but we don't know if it should tell you the answer right now, um, if that's a good thing for it to do. It's so like it lies. And sometimes, it, you know, it lies. It's worth bearing in mind that the way it works is by predicting the, the next word every time. And it turns out, talking about originality again, that, you know, a lot of these things can just be reduced down into the particular order of words that you say. And after you say enough of them, it becomes an idea. So when does that happen, right? So all of these kind of questions. Um, I mean, I think you, you probably couldn't help but really think about that when designing those models. Because, you know, as you write a model that's looking to predict the next word in a sequence of words or character in a sequence of characters, you know, you're designing that logic. Um, right, so then that's a code bias, right? Um, well, you know, so that's a, that's a very complex question for sure. Um, surely there's bias everywhere. Anytime you put anything to paper or commit anything to writing, you know, it's, it's injecting the bias of, of what we do, and that includes code. Um, at the same time, what makes some of these models interesting, and of course neural nets and all that kind of stuff, is the fact that, you know, it, it's a little bit of a, not a like total black box, but a little bit of a black box in terms of what those actual weights on the model are, what's their train, and so on and so forth, um, you know, which is a blessing and a curse of those models, right? So um, you're going to get some unique outcomes, maybe you can't really see how you got to those outcomes always. There's a lot of research in that field that's being done, um, you know, which I can't speak to all of that for sure. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, bias, bias is probably, some degree of bias is probably inevitable. And as always, it's, it's a question of, you know, how open and unrestrained you wanna be and how, um, let's say, in line with, with norms and safe you wanna be. It's like a question of our time, right? So this is just another manifestation of that. You know, the more limits you place on it, um, maybe the less it can be used for, but uh, perhaps, perhaps that's better. So again, just conservatism, liberalism, right? The spectrum of philosophical outcomes, um, you know, shows up here again, for sure. Mm -hmm. well, I, th I think a lot of the, um, you know, what, what, what comes out of a um, uh, you know, neural net or, or any model actually is dependent on, um, is mostly dependent uh, in the general case, certainly on the, the data that's used to train it. So, I mean, you could argue that the internet is, uh, is largely Western, white, uh, affluent society driven. Right? Certainly. And so that's so chat GPT and you know, all these other, uh, Dali, et cetera, they all, they are all trained off of that corpus of data, right, which is the internet. Um, you know, we've used things about like chat GPT about, you know, ask it questions from the, the, uh, the, uh, the Putin supporter view of the war in Ukraine versus the you know, Zelensky's view of the war in Ukraine. Right? And uh, um, it really would depend on sort of which, uh, you know, what your training set was. So I think that in, in terms of, um, you know, when you talk about bias or originality, that uh, you know, at some point in the munging of the numbers, right, you probably end up with something you know, creative and unique. But there is also there is a good slice of it, I think, which is really dependent on the biases in the data. And that's, there's a lot of research on that. Um, and I think there are demonstrated biases in a lot of the AI, and this comes down to training mm -hmm. sets. Absolutely. Um, and you know, just to tie that in, you see that with people too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't like nature and nurture, but it's. Uh, it's all what's around you in a large, uh, in a large world. So, um, 
you know, it's, I think, somewhat inescapable, um, you know, as a constraint. But, but yeah, you can't see beyond the boundaries of the world you're in. And for these models, that is the data that they have. Absolutely true. And worth bearing in mind, right, as we pursue those kind of ethical considerations, um, where is this training data coming from? Who has access to the, you know, the repositories where that data was made? Um, you know, the internet is predominantly used by a certain part of the world. Uh, and that's where it learns. That's where it gets its information. It's interesting, of course, that talking about restraint, you know, the, the latest uh, GPT model, transformer model, um, you know, was, I think, cut off at 2021 for open it for ChatGPT, and they're working on ChatGPT 4, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, there are, there's, there's thought when it, that went into that decision as well, beyond just, okay, we, this takes a long time to train. It's also, um, I guess, how current do you want to be, um, and then all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's very true. It's a very relevant point, it's worth remembering. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it seem like um, a consideration that in talking about these data sets and talking about the applications, that the ones that are based on science, that are based on math, that are based on geology, are pretty objective. But it strikes me that while it may be a threat to some of the humanities, some of the arts, it also may actually make those more essential because they are, by their very nature, not really duplicable outside of the human experience. I think there's an argument to be made that there could actually be a benefit to the humanitarian disciplines that are apart from science and math and objective. Certainly, um, I think that's a great point. Yeah, uh, you know, as someone with a little arts background, I sure hope that's the case as well, myself. Um, yes, I mean, if anything, if nothing else, it does highlight the uh, influence of that kind of work on the world, right? I mean, if you're worried that, um, you know, about image generation, um, or, or artwork, or writing, or any of those things, and realizing how central it is to everything that we do, right? Um, you know, it at least emphasizes its importance, um, and ideally, you know, it's placed alongside those other disciplines. It, it's all the same, um, it's all the same kind of paradigm, right? Pattern recognition is the name of the game, same for neural nets as it is for us. Um, and in my opinion, having done both, there's not a ton of difference between writing code and writing an essay. Um, it's largely the same. It's largely the same. You're looking for that perfect organization. You're looking for that perfect clarity of expression of ideas as efficiently as possible um, to accomplish tasks that you want to accomplish. So on an abstract level, it's largely the same, which is also why OpenAI can write, you know, both code and essays, same as a human can. Um, yeah, so perhaps it'll reveal more of the similarities than the differences, which I think is a, a wonderful silver lining, if that's the case. It would be a hope. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's one other thing that um, I I understand now with all of this emerging that there's a really a controversy arising that almost everything that we see we no longer are going to know if it's real or if it's simulated, and so there is an opening here for a huge amount of fake information, fake news, replicated things that are not genuine, and I wonder I would just be interested in your thoughts on that and where you might see that playing out. Yeah, well, that's super important. Um, yes, uh, well, I think, you know, I mean, actually, there's historically a lot of, you know, precedents and, and parallels to questions about what's real information, what's not, you know, obviously going back through the 20th century before really since, like, information theory showed up. But, um, you know, what's, what's real information? Like, what's in the set of things that are real versus not real? And can you tell them? Does it matter? Um, and the good news is, at least as I see it, that a lot of thought in philosophy and political theory has gone into developing um, those constructs. There's a whole, you know, obviously a whole field around that. And so I guess the question is, how does that field react to these new developments, right? Which enable you to do the same kind of, the same kind of dangers as before, right, around, you know, uh, misstatements or falsehoods or things of that nature, but now at a speed and scale and accessibility that allows almost anyone to do it at scale, right? Um, and so, you know, presumably, I mean, I guess you probably see some sort of, uh, you know, conversion um, or, uh, you know, regression to a certain to a certain point, basically, where all these things come to a head. Um, you know, in one way or another, maybe in different fields, but people are going to have to grapple with it, right? Um, because 
it's a very real problem, and, and really now more so than ever, it's the fact that it's accessible to so many people. Such, such diversity of ideas, whether they're true or false, is now accessible to more people than ever before, and there's more people than ever before every year. Um, I, so I guess in answer to that question, without going too much into specifics, for me, when I think about it, I look at the um, analogies that we have from being at least partially a history major from the past, right? And some of the systems that like rose and rose and fell, um, you know, previously, and the way that information kind of factored into those systems. But without getting, you know, I guess too in the weeds about that, my, my consolation is looking at what came before and seeing that despite some of those things that came to pass, um, the newness of humanity continued to spark on and we, you know, continue to create ultimately what we hope is a better world. There's an analogy here, even with your company, I would think, because the data, the big data that you're working with, has presumably errors in it to some degree. Absolutely. So that would be like fake news. Basically. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, part of it is you assume, first off, you assume it's going to be there. Um, you know, you do not assume you're going to get perfect information from the viewpoint. Um, and, you know, kind of like you were saying, to a certain degree, you, you have to kind of accept, not accept, but uh, understand that your model is going to be limited by the data that it's got. And every time we try to change that and put in kind of our assumptions about how to fix that data, we're also then injecting bias as well. Um, and so is that better? I guess it's accepting, um, you know, accepting a flawed base state really, you know, really any worse than kind of manipulating it a lot, putting in our own biases, and then saying, now that's the ground truth? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Because um, if you're always putting in bias and it's always going to be slightly wrong, you know, there's just sort of like an error propagation there that just kind of keeps on going. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's really, really, really case specific. I mean, there are, you know, you can always cut down the amount of information that you're looking at too to get to a much more clean model, but then it's not going to be as good. Um, or you can open it up to more data and more of it's going to be bad, uh, but you, know, you can do more with it. And again, I just kind of, I fall back on the human element. I just look at it and say, all right, well, you know, I sure make a lot of bad decisions occasionally, right? Mm -hmm. um, like everybody does, and I have imperfect information, and you know, it, it, it tends to work out um, you know, more often than not, and sort of the best that you can hope for, right? So a lot of it is like, you, know, you, you build your model, and you go out there, and you, you do your best with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's... There's really no great answer, so it's a good question. In law, in law there's, there's something called a defamation, and a complete defense is truth. It's a complete defense to a defamation charge. But then, who is the arbiter of the truth? Turns out it's 12 people who couldn't get out of it. Uh, during <laughs> so. But, you know, that's profound. That's and, right, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. far. So far. But uh, in answer to your question, and it's related, uh, uh, this guy, Harari, wrote, uh, you probably heard of him. Anyway, he's got a book, uh, Homo Deus, and I think he answers a lot of that stuff. <clears throat> so here's a historical uh, question for you. So this, by my count, is about um, AI is going to change the world version three. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, right. Um, it's actually interesting, just as a sort of sidebar comment on even that, which is that, so when the, the, um, the telephone was invented, the, uh, the, the, sort of the talk in the newspapers was that this was going to kill social relationships because people wouldn't have to actually talk to each other face to face. Um, and it was, a huge, it was a huge thing about whether everyone should have a telephone or not. I mean, this was when three people in town would have a telephone. It was taken over by teenagers and that saved them. Yeah, I was going to say But um, anyway, so but so we, you know, that that was the telephone, and then we, you know, we've had various iterations of AI. You know, there was the, all the, the vision, the early when it when had vision stuff, and, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so um, and the, the last the last couple of iterations of AI really kind of fizzled out. I mean, we have. We had ARPA, right, which mm -hmm. was uh, ARPA, which was uh, you know, which actually a huge amount of money put in. I mean, the good thing we got out of that 
course, there was the internet, ultimately. Um, but in terms of all the other pieces of investment in AI, that, that kind of a lot of it kind of fizzled. And I think that the, uh, um, you know, there's this well-known curve in the technology industry. There's the, um, there's the, 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 the sort of the mountain of unreasonable expectations followed by the pit of despair. It's, it's the classic uh, forest or the garden, I think, the, yeah. um, cycle. And so I'm, I'm curious where you would, uh, where you would place us on, the, on that curve and whether you think that what's happening now with, with AI will be, um, um, will, will kind of, will, will kind of uh, seep away in, in the ways that the, the previous attempts have. Yeah, great question. Well, I mean, certainly if it's a if it's a cyclical pattern, right? I mean, I'd say we're on, we're on the up here. Um, I don't think we've peaked, but we're definitely, you know, we're not on the downside of that hill at the moment for this particular wave. And they do talk about in the literature um, AI winters, as they do with with a lot of fields of study. I mean, even looking at this, right? I mean, there's a couple of key events that led to the creation of these large language models. Um, you have neural nets in the '90s, followed by not a whole lot really in the 2000s, um, some key innovations, and then the transformer model by Google in 2017, which enabled um, you know, a lot of this basically to, to occur. Um, and so you know, that's why I think that uh, to your question, it's like what will happen to all of these people that are, you know, that are working in these jobs that they feel may be displaced by this? Well, you know, if history is any indication, right, it's that we will probably grow and adapt alongside the technology, much as we always have. Um, just in the same way that you know, phones, um, you know, we, we still do communicate. Although you could also argue that social media is quite polarizing and very isolating. So um, maybe, maybe it is slowly killing, uh, you know, human interaction that way. Who knows, right? You, you can look at it from a lot of different angles, I think. But ultimately, we're still here, um, and we're still coming up with new things, and that's um, you know probably likely to continue to be the case, at least in my estimation for, for the foreseeable future, certainly like any, almost any timeline I can think of, I certainly expect us to be in it, um, but I'm biased, you know, <laughs> so. Maybe yeah. we'll take one more. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly. If there is one more. <laughs> no one was the last cookie. I just want to say, just for fun, that I love this conversation of this is about a technology that's based on mathematics and the abstraction of mathematics, and we're talking about questions like, what is original? What is real? And we're talking about these questions that have no answers, and it's all being stimulated by the, this, this technology. And another thing that comes to my mind is people are asking, and certainly in a rural community like this, like our environmental issues, are we even a part of nature? And now we're asking the question, are we a part of technology? It's like we've leapfrogged over, and now we're even asking, are we even a part of what we've created? Well, and it's just, that's why I wanted to come tonight, so I appreciate this conversation. Um, I don't know if it, you guys have seen that article in the New York Times this, about talking, so could you speak to that just a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I read that this morning. Um, I see you referring to one with the, the new being uh, shop off, where we take it down quite the, quite the radical. Yeah. yeah, so um, just to kind of summarize the article very briefly, so um, one, I don't know if it's a journalist or whomever who was involved with that article, but they essentially, um, looking at the new the Bing search, right, which is powered by um, those open AI models that Microsoft invested in, um, they try basically to kind of get the chatbot down a particular path, right? They push it down a sort of an incongruent path that is, um, has to do with, like, you know, emotions and how you feel about yourself and your psychology, your shadow self, and all this very like the psychological stuff and, and then you know, how do you feel about me, the, the the one that's asking the questions, do you love me? All these kind of things, right? Um, and it says some fairly disconcerting things in response, like to put it mildly, like uh, which, you know and, and I think perhaps for me the most disconcerting thing is every word in there comes from us. Like everything is learned from other people and the things that it's seen, right? So whatever we create, we really have only ourselves to thank, and I think that's a big takeaway, <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> Sounds like Forbidden Planet. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, that was a great, great way to end it. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I just, before we wrap it up, uh, I want to just uh, give a shout out to Erica, who's the chair of the board of Sierra Commons, and Eric, who's a 
new board member. Thanks to the volunteers and Ethan for presenting. And uh, let's keep this up. Let's keep the the conversation going. And thanks, Richard, for letting us hang out in your cool space. Yeah. So we're doing it again next month. There's a whole list of events at SierraCommons.org. So will that be here? Uh, Richard, will that be here? <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs>